You're listening to a podcast from The Word. So, here we go. Stag body game. Am I going first? I oh, am. Go I on. am. I've actually got two, but I'm only going to give you one this week. I'm so far <laughs> ahead here. Okay. <laughs> this one concerns a, a favourite literary uh, theme of, of, of yours and mine, actually. Oh, well, mine's literary too, but go on. Yeah, this is interesting. Oh, well, let's it's a literary special. Let's hope we haven't dropped on the same one. This one uh, refers to that home, that club, that social club, that gentleman's club for feckless second sons of the aristocracy. P.G. Woodhouse's The Drones Club. Very okay. good. Uh, you know, the home Gussie of, Fink Nottle. The home of right. G- G- obviously very well known people like Gussie Fink Nottle, Oofy Prosser, and Oofy like, Prosser. A, a, a Toppy Glossop of the like. Beans and Crumpets. Yeah, go on. But, yep. but. What you may not know is there are lots of less well-known members of the Drones Club, but Very none good. That, none the less existed. And so you have to tell me whether these people are musicians who one time or another played with uh, significant groups or lesser known members of the drones. Okay. okay. That's brilliant. Are you that's ready? Fantastic. Are you that's, ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Here's the first one. Biscuit Biscuiton. Biscuit Biscuiton. Is that a musician or a member of PG Woodhouse's Drones Club? Are you suggesting there really could have been a that's that's fantastic. I don't <laughs> I really don't know that. That's but I, I think it's too it's too arch to be a rock musician. I'm saying PG Woodhouse. It is indeed the Viscount Biscuiton, heir to the Earl of Hoddesdon, known to his friends as Biscuit. Okay. That's, <laughs> that's, that's, this that's, is that's the brilliant. first one. Here so we go. Good. Marmaduke Dawson the Fourth. Marmaduke Dawson the Fourth. Is that a musician? That's a rock musician. Uh, do you know where from? No, but I remember that <laughs> name from somewhere. It, go on, where is it? It's American. He was, he was a guitarist with a new rise of the purple. Sound. Perfect. That's it. That's it. <laughs> yeah. just, just brilliant. These are superb, Dave. Okay. This is so here, funny. Here we go. Boff Wally. Boff Wally, member of the Drones, or lesser new musician. Member Boff of the Dr- Wally, I would have thought, oh. must have been in Glenn Cornick's Wild Turkey or something. <laughs> he's, a, he's clearly a rock musician. Boff! How could he not be a rock musician be called Boff? OK, yeah, he's a guitarist with Chumba Wamba. Oh, uh, fantastic! That's fantastic! <laughs> How on earth did you find these? This is so good. I don't know what you Googled to find out oh, aristocratic God. names. So, no, go on, go on, this is brilliant. Uh, OK, Boko Fiddleworth. Boko Fiddleworth is that a drone? (laughs) (laughs) He is a drone. I remember Fiddleworth, I'm afraid, but that's fantastic. That's so good. Woodhouse says he presents to the beholder a face like an intellectual parrot. Okay. (laughs) Monty Oxymoron. Monty Oxymoron. Member of the drones or a musician? Oxymoron is too too complicated for a PG Woodhouse. That must be a musician. But it wouldn't be a 60s or 70s musician called Oxymoron. It must again be in the it's 80s, 90s. 90s musician. Yeah, well, he played keyboards with the damned. That's, that's all fantastic. That's all I know. Oxymoron, that's so good. Okay, Freddie Bullivant. Freddie Bullivant. Is he a, a less known member of the drones or a musician? Freddie I think he's probably Bullivant. a drone, actually, but uh, uh, go on, which... He was, he was a drone. Good at this polo. So good. <laughs> like, uh, listen to this. Good at polo, otherwise unmarked by enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that really unmarked by That's enterprise? That's so funny. Oh, good grief. These uh, are brilliant. Okay, Toby Horsnail. Toby Horsnail. Member of the Drones or a musician? Or drummer of Budgie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, he was probably in, uh, yeah, Griffin. Griffin is the sort of group you might have been in, actually. Yeah, I think he's a rock musician. Uh, I think you're beating me all ends up this week. He's no, an occa- occasional vocalist with the Enid. Oh, that's <laughs> uh, so good. And uh, I'm going to give you one final one. Okay. Monty Bing. Monty Bing. Monty Bing, that could really easily be either, couldn't it? Monty Bing. Um, I, I, I'm going to say drone, but I... I, I go you on. beat me, absolutely. <laughs> You're giving me a hide in this week. That is absolutely he's, inspired. He's, That's he's so man, funny. He's the man whose sartorial tastes encouraged Bertie to get a suit 
which Jeeves said would make him look like a bookie. <laughs> that is so... You're going to have to tell me later, uh, you know, off air, how you did that. You must have kind of Googled rock musician and Monty or whatever. You must have put in, you must have put in posh and That's aristocratic I names. I, found, I, I got, got loads of first <laughs> names. So that I thought, wouldn't it be funny if there was a, a, a musician called, you know... Bo- With a surname oxymoron. Boofy or whatever. That's you know? right. Those and are that, brilliant. That's how I found it. But I didn't win, so no. anyway... Yeah. Oh, oh well, look, this is uh, this is literary too, and from an original idea by listener Pete Selby, okay. which I've tinkered with slightly. Very good. Okay, okay, and it's it, now, now Morrissey songs tend to contain flowery aphorisms and witty and waspish philosophical pronouncements, right. somewhat in the shadow of his great hero Oscar Wilde. Yes, but yes. can you tell the difference? Be prepared to play Morrissey song title or quote from Oscar Wilde. <laughs> Okay. All right. Okay. So the first one is okay. My life is a succession of people saying goodbye. Is that wild or is that Morrissey song? My that's, life is a succession of people saying goodbye. That's Morrissey. It is. It's from You Are the Quarry. Very good. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's hard to walk tall when you're small. Wow. I don't know, Morrissey. It's, I get it's Morrissey. I thought you might be thrown by that because uh, he's so enormously tall. But yeah, no, it's Morrissey from the Swords compilation. Okay, no good deed goes unpunished. I know that it's Oscar Wilde. It is Oscar Wilde. You can kind of hear a backbeat to it, though, can't you? Sort of <laughs> yeah. Tortuous, you know, not yeah. quite rhythmic uh, arrangement of it. You know, noise is the best revenge. That's got to be Morrissey. It, you know, it is Morrissey, actually. It's an unreleased song from a radio session on the Janice Long show. OK. I'm not young enough to know everything. Oh. That's Oscar Wilde. Oscar Wilde. We're, we're having 100% success with each other's questions. This time. <laughs> that is Oscar Wilde. OK. There is a place in hell for me and my friends. Oh, now. Wow. Hmm. Oscar Wilde? Actually, it's Morrissey, but in fact, Oscar oh. Wilde did say, I can't remember who it was, though. Oscar Wilde said something almost exactly the same. <laughs> See, like, who'd want to go to hell because none of my friends would be there, I think is that's, what it is. That's the key thing. Morrissey obviously just leaves through books of Oscar Wilde yeah, quotations yeah, yeah. I think, that goes, if only I could be quite as, <laughs> quite as witty as that. How can I arrange that and pass it off as my own? Exactly. I think it was something like, who would go to hell because none of my friends were there? Yeah, but Morrissey's always called, there's a place in hell for me and my friends. Okay, the ninth one is, if you don't like me, don't look at me. Oh, that's good. I'm going to ask a while. No, it's no, it's Miles, actually. It's, okay, the, it's the B-side of Youngest Was the Most Loved. All right. And the last one, actually, which I'm sure you'll get, is, is uh, only dull people are brilliant at breakfast. That's got to be Oscar Wilde. It is. Actually, rather gave it away there, but I'm sure you'll get it, because clearly breakfast. If, if I meant Morrissey, you wouldn't do it wouldn't have been a you breakfast. You not being a Morrissey world, world Morrissey right. expert. That is fantastic. Those were very good. Yours was absolutely <laughs> superb. The drones, that's hilarious. Well, I love I, it. I've got one ready for next week already. Good work. That's I very mean, good work. I Ahead of the really, game. Yeah, very yeah, good. yeah. So this week, uh, you're our correspondent on the presidential inauguration because you watched all of it, didn't you? I well, I say, watched all of it, yeah. I watched the first bit as they were all coming in. I was watching C-SPAN, the American you know, political channel which had just uh, just the arrivals without announcements yeah which i quite like because you were trying to work out who those people were when they were all wearing masks over half their faces yeah so that was exciting spot american politicians that's quite interesting and i watched i watched but kamala Bernie harris unrecognizable i was kamala harris being in, 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 inaugurated and then a, a voice from above said ladies and gentlemen jennifer lopez now that oh no click off I <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't think we need showbiz of these things. But theatrical, anyway. yes, a, a, a theatrical performance will be on the cards. It's interesting how the people who do those things are the people who can, can really sing, and they make you, they remind you of the fact. Lady Gaga being a really good, who I thought was fantastic. I love Lady Gaga, but she really can sing. And in her concerts, there are the whole episodes where it's just her on her own, kind of improvising to make the point that she's not Madonna. That's the thing, isn't it? Oh, like, right. Madonna, you know, it's interesting that Madonna has never done an inauguration because Madonna, obviously Madonna can't sing, but her vocals is not the strong suit, is it? I right. mean, there, there may well be a lot of uh, 
a lot of assistance uh, technologically. She never exposes herself in situations like that, you know. All right, right. But no, I thought she was, I thought Garth Brooks was fine. And, and Spring, Springsteen is, has, has just become the new Dylan, is not he? Dylan won't do these things anymore. Dylan's meant to be the guy, as he was at Live Aid, who finishes these events with a fabulous uh, minor chord folk song. <laughs> you know, about, isn't he? About, uh, about uh, you know, about, about the suffering in American life or whatever. But, uh, but Springsteen was fantastic. I think. No, I think the real star was Amanda Gorman. Did you see that? I know. No, the no. poet. Right. I thought she was extraordinary. You know, there's this girl. It's the, that's the thing about the modern world of social, social media is that you can go literally over, oh, in seconds from being reasonably well-known over there, which she was, to, um, to being enormously globally, internationally famous in, in six minutes that it took her to do that poem. You know, she put on 1.1 million Twitter followers in about 24 hours. <laughs> Phenomenal, isn't it? Makes you sick, Frank. Yeah, yeah. And her, and her books, she's got these two poetry books out. Went to number one and number two on Amazon. Phenomenal. <laughs> Makes me double sick. Double sick. <laughs> no, but come on, the big news in, in your camp is Dolly Parton, sure. Well, yeah. I, Go on. I, 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 just, I just say something about my, my granddaughters, which is, and I'm not going to say any cute things kids say or that they're amazing or anything like that, but I've got, I've got three-year-old granddaughters, twin granddaughters, and they've developed their, their first musical obsession. And who is it? Is it Taylor Swift? No. Is it Stormzy? No. It's Dolly Parton. And I, you know, they come, they come around to this house and they come up to my workroom at the top of the house and they go, play Dolly, play Dolly. And I thought, what's this talking about? And uh, I asked my daughter, she said, oh, it's Dolly Parton. I said, what, why, where have they got Dolly Parton from? And I said, well, somebody bought them a book for Christmas called Little People, Big Dreams, which is a series of these things, which are bestsellers for small children at the moment, where they're kind of... They're, they're cute little stories about the struggle, the adver- struggles against adversity of, of heroines, you know, I don't know. I've seen it's it. RuPaul, isn't it? Frida Kahlo, oh, Aretha okay. Franklin, Agatha yes. Christie, Billie yeah. Jean King, yeah. Pele. I was <laughs> amazed. I look at the at Bowie. There's one of Bowie as well. Yeah. It's really it's interesting. Just, and I thought, why are they fixed upon Dolly Parton? And uh, so they come up and they demand that I play nine to five or Jolene or whatever, you know, just four or five of our better known songs, all of which are wildly different in style, really. You know, so it's, yeah, yeah. it's not the sound of, of it at all. But what struck me uh, when I spent some time with them and they, they were enthusing about Dolly Parton and jumping up and down to the sound of nine to five. Is is the key key thing about Dolly Parton that is immensely appealing to three year old girls? Do you know what it is? It's going to be something like the hat she wears or the hair. No, or, or well, the we'll, come, we'll come to that in a second. Yeah, it's this, Mark. She's called Dolly. Oh, <laughs> she's called Dolly. If you're a three year old girl, what's not to like about somebody called Dolly? That's so, true. You know what I mean? Because they like dolls. You know, they're in that phase. Yeah. And um, and so this is this is a, a living dolly, you know, who who can be summoned on the television or the computer by the click of a mouse in any way. And 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 the beauty of Dolly Parton is, if you look at her at pretty much any stage over the last forty years, she largely looks the same. Looks exactly then, the same because she arrived at that look pretty much like at the same time as Barbie arrived at her look and has has stuck to it, you know. Pretty rigidly ever since, hasn't she? Completely. I'll be a I'll be laced a, up rhinestone top, you know. I'll, yeah. be a, I'll be a facial reconstruction, you know, aside. She largely looks the same, you know. I'm looking at her the other day, she's 75 or something. She, she looks is. like she did when she was 50. And uh, and um, the other thing where it made me made me think of was that time I went to see her at Hammersmith Odium. It must be about 15 years ago now. Our friend Brent Hansen took me to see her at, at Hammersmith when she played with a bluegrass band. She was making a kind of one of her occasional detours back into traditional music. And um, and there she was on stage at Hammersmith. And, uh, and she's such an extraordinary figure because, you know, everybody wants to claim Dolly Parton, don't they? Everybody wants to yeah. think... Dolly Parton's on our team, you know, whether whether we're kind of old-fashioned Wembley Country Festival people 
or cutting edge, you know, time out people or everybody in between. Everybody wants a bit of Dolly Parton. And the people who really wanted a piece of Dolly Parton on this particular occasion were a bunch of, small bunch of what I can only describe as militant lesbians who, who had contrived a rather half-hearted stage invasion at some, at some point <laughs> from the side. They appeared from the side and headed towards Dolly, the, the figure of Dolly, who was in the middle of the stage with a band around them. And at this point, a, a minder who'd obviously been watching the scene unfold and thought this could happen. So a large number of them broke, got well, onto the stage. Two, and two to three coming towards her. Minders interceded. One of them held them back while the other man, minder picked up Dolly pretty much like you might a doll. Okay. Yeah. And, and put pretty much put her under his arm and went off the stage carrying her because the truth about Dolly Pun is particularly when she's in her full stage regalia, there is no part of her that moves independently. <laughs> so I'm perfectly serious here. It was like somebody removing a dummy from uh, a, a mannequin, a, dark, a, a shop mannequin. window. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, in Are You Being Served? Yes, a a old, completely <laughs> stiff figure under one old, arm. The right. old caretaker used to, used to come on, you know, janitor figure used to yeah. come on all the time, carrying some figure under his arm. It was just like that. And as she went off, she was kind of sideways, you know, smiling at the audience. I'll be back in a minute. Waving. That's fantastic. So, you know... That's my point about why Dolly Parton is immensely appealing to three-year-old girls. She's called Dolly, and she looks That's like That's brilliant. Everybody and, wants to adopt her. You're so absolutely. right. I remember seeing, I remember seeing her in, in the Central Park in summer 1973, and she was on with Tammy Wynette at a concert. It was so funny. Oh. The whole of New York had turned up, and New York was dressed in check shirts and cowboy hats, yeah. you know, playing at being kind of country fans for the day. Nobody had come in from outside of New York to see this entirely New York event. Because they kind of like the idea that it's the unvarnished opposite of showbiz. Actually, it's just as varnished and just as showbiz as anything else. It's very, very varnished. I know, It's I know. the most showbiz thing you've ever seen. I know. Like. The well, interesting anyway. pop fact about Dolly Parton, I always thought, was, uh, was uh, um, I, I Will Always Love You. When when Colonel Tom Parker, didn't he, he say to her, um, this is really, really early on, that Elvis wanted to cover it, but Elvis wanted to cover it on the condition that they could get 50% of the publishing. Oh, well, he always Because obviously it would be a hit, which he used to do all the time, you know. Yeah. And she very wisely held out and said, no, I'll make it my own or, or whatever. Second pop, second pop fact about I Will Always Love You, written the same day as Jolene. Oh, really? God, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> that was an earner, wasn't that's, it? That's an, she earned that, her call that, that's a, that's a product that Tuesday. That's incredible. <laughs> well, God bless her. The Word Podcast. Prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. So, Phil Spector, um, I, can, I can remember so clearly um, when Phil Spector kind of entered my life. Uh, because he was, the, he was the first producer I was ever ever aware of. I suppose that was the that was the really striking thing was that uh, you know you take those Phil Spector records and obviously hundreds of people were involved in them, writing them, singing them, playing on them, engineering yeah, four them, bass whatever. guitars, ten guitars, absolutely three drummers, yeah. And but his. The clever thing he did was he positioned himself as the producer. Yeah. And so he became more famous than than the record than the people who made the records. And I no, I agree. I was aware of George Martin only through the bit of mind you. I was only mid sixties when I first heard of Phil Spector, so I was only been twelve or whatever. But uh, I, I was aware of George Martin as a facilitator for the Beatles. But I wasn't sure actually that stage what a producer did. But no. Phil Spector was the first one you thought, right, this is the this is the orchestrator, this is the director of the architect of the entire thing. And yeah, it was in 65 was the big breakthrough, wasn't it? Was that was that well, when Andrew uh, Alden uh, took out uh, that uh, ad? He'd had the no, there'd been hits before then, you know, the kind of the Ronettes and um and the crystals and so forth, you know, because 
it's also a reminder of the fact that people very often say, oh, before the Beatles, there was nothing, you know, post rock and roll, before the Beatles, there was nothing. Not true. There was Phil Spector, there was Motown, there was Roy Orbison, there was the Everly Brothers, you know, loads, loads of things. And, um, but uh, he, uh, he, he came to Britain quite a, quite a bit in those early days of uh, the kind of Beatlemania and Ready Steady Go and the Rolling Stones and all that. You know, he's, he famously, I think he plays Maracas, doesn't he, on an early Rolling Stones single, I think. I think he does. Yeah, well, um, there's, a, there's an extract of Craig, Craig Brown's book, isn't there, where, where he arrives in a party with, with Ronnie, uh, Ronnie, soon to be Spectre. And, and John Lennon tries to cop off with her. Well, yeah. Absolutely. That was in 64, I think, yeah. And... Um, and he, uh, you know, he was so kind of publicity conscious that he, he made sure that the, the Ronettes went back um, on an earlier flight so that he could fly back into the States on the same flight that brought the Beatles into the States. Because he knew, so he, it was almost like, oh, look what I brought you, America. Completely. Back, you know, because he, he was such a kind of... Um, There's a lot of it. Ringo said he was such a such a, an anxious flyer that he never sat down. He just paced up and down. So he said he walked to America. <laughs> <laughs> he just walked up and down the corridor of the plane. But, but yeah, thing, brilliant piece of engineering. Buddy. But the thing I was thinking about was from, probably a year later, actually. It is definitely a year later. In January 1965... Um, You've Lost That Loving Feeling comes out in the UK. And it comes out, I think, probably slightly ahead in a version by Scylla Black. And of course, Scylla Black had, you know, her early hits were all kind of Dionne Warwick song, you know, yeah. Burt Bacharach and David, things that have been a hit in the States for all or other countries for other people. Yeah, and, anyone um, who had a heart was Dionne Warwick song. Yeah, it? and... Yeah. Um, and so you've lost love and feeling seems to be the same thing. And I remember hearing the Righteous Brothers version, which used to be played by Tony Hall, who only died last year, I think. Tony Hall, who was the great kind of plugger, scene maker, radio DJ, he used to do a program on Radio Luxembourg uh, on Saturday evening, which was the first hip radio I ever remember hearing. And he would play uh, largely American records. And he was the one who played you know, Loving Feeling, the Righteous Brothers. And he thought, my God, this is extraordinary. And then you heard the Scylla Black version. You thought, well, obviously, Scylla will have the hit, you know, because she's Scylla. She, by then, she was already the nation's sweetheart, you know. And who are these guys? You know, they're an American record company. Uh, it won't happen. And Scylla goes in the charts and, and so forth. And, and I, I can well remember the feeling. I can remember sitting in Mr. Heath's maths class. <laughs> I really can remember this, thinking, and I'd looked at the chart, the record mirror chart, and thought, no, she's gonna get, they're going to get over it. Scylla Black will go to number one, and they'll, they'll yeah. just be forgotten. And there was, you know, I, I've actually got the chart in front of me here from January the 30th, 1965 the record mirror chart, which has Go Now by the Moody Blues at number one. It has You've Lost That Loving Feeling in Stella Black at number two, and You've Lost That Loving Feeling by the Righteous Brothers at number three. Extraordinary. And you thought, well, there's only one number one. And the following week, the Righteous Brothers were at number one. I don't remember the feeling of kind of, you know, you know, when you're 40... There is a God. You always want to feel it's fair, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> and and, uh, and Righteous Brothers have gone to number one. It's still a black record, just fell away, and nobody talked, talked about it anymore. I can remember that feeling. And, and a lot of that was to do with the fact that Andrew Oldham had, apparently out of his own pocket, financed um, a load of ads in the, in the, in the music papers. And uh, and he's I'm really one here that he took an ad saying, this advert is not for commercial gain. It is taken as something must be said about the great new Phil Spector, Phil Spector record, the Righteous Brothers singing, you've lost that loving feeling. Already in the American top ten, this is Spector's greatest production. The last word in tomorrow's sound today, exposing the overall mediocrity of the music industry and typifying his greatness. You know. And uh, you know, but well, wasn't it, that part that helped? Go on. That was a bit of positioning by Oldham himself. Oh wasn't God! It? I mean, because oh, yeah. he. 
you know, if you look at those ads for Rolling Stone records, and there's one in the in Rolling Stones records, there's one in that same issue, actually. At the bottom, it says, produced by uh, Andrew uh, Lou Goldham for Impact Sound. So he himself was trying to position himself as the next Spectre, I think, the next kind of O2. Well, producer, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Well, he did, though, not long after that. He did those, uh, the Andrew Lou Oldham Orchestra's version yeah, of yeah. Rolling Stones. Songs, which is what I ended up As on Verve, by Verve, the Verve, yeah. uh, many many years later, because Spectre had done that. He'd, if you looked on the on the big side of all those early Spectre huge hit singles, which he didn't write because they were Ellie Greenwich songs or Carol King songs or whatever Brill building songs. Yeah, uh, he he would uh, he would uh, the B side was always the Phil Spector Orchestra, so that he could get paid as much as as much as the A side. Um, but you know, I, I have to think that the, the, the thing about it is that nothing better um, underlines the difference between a song and a record than those early absolutely records because they're dramas, aren't they? Complete they're, drama. they're a production dramas. Yeah, total drama. They, you, 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 you listened to them with all your concentration, didn't you? Because they, they weren't just background; they utterly dominated. You know, completely, they were utterly larger than life. And justice um, prevailed. It got to number one. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, there's been all sorts of stuff about him. Anthony De Curtis, uh, the Rolling Stone writer, sort of reposted some of his um, interview with him. I think in the eighties, nineties, and uh, those is full of extraordinary details. One is that Spectre takes John Lennon on his birthday to on Lennon's birthday to a Parisian restaurant, and in the middle of the meal, um, violinists appear. There's a little string quartet playing in the restaurant, and the two violinists are sent over to play Yesterday at their table. Can you imagine? It's just awful on every level, isn't it? It's ruined it for them. It's ruined it for all the other people in the restaurant who now have to acknowledge that John Lennon and Phil Spector are there, which they didn't know, probably didn't care about anyway. And third, he's played yesterday. Oh, Can you imagine? God. Imagine what a birthday wrecking experience, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, my, my memory of, uh, of Spectre particularly is the Q Awards. Do you remember yeah. that in 1997? Oh, I, do. I, do. I mean, I'd, I'd thought that he was a good idea to get along because I thought, well, Phil Spector, you know, everyone will be thrilled. I, I completely misread the fact that actually his his reputation was in a real alter. No one was talking about him at all, actually, in 97. But I spent three or four months trying to get him to come. And Radiohead were there, and the Prodigy and Pete Townsend and Roger Daltrey, Ken Russell, Spike Milligan, McCartney. And I thought, this is going to be the cherry on the cake. It's going to be fantastic. And endless negotiations. You know, he demanded a, 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 a more expensive flights and the, 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 the suite in the in the Savoy and the six seat of black limousine and the binders and all that. All of which I managed to avoid paying for. But he insisted that he arrived last. He wanted everyone to be in before he arrived. I thought well, this is great. You know, this is going to this is going to really excite the photographers. You know, so they were all in. Spike Milligan. You know, the Who, McCartney. The limo turns up. I didn't tell them who it was. They're all there waiting, you know. And the door opened out, bundled the minder with his, you know, looking like he was packing heat. And behind him, this extraordinary, tiny little odd man in an ill-fitting wig. There was this terrible silence. No one knew who it was until suddenly someone went, oh, fucking hell, it's Dudley Moore. And that was it. You know, it was just, <laughs> virtually nobody took a photograph. <laughs> He then went in and was very odd with everybody, really hot and cold. You know, he talked to Peter Blake, was quite friendly. And he talked to, I introduced him to Pete Townsend. Pete Townsend says, oh, yeah, we met in 65. I remember this with you with, with the Ronettes and this, that, and the other. He said, uh, and what are you doing now, Phil? He said, right now, he said, I'm having this conversation with you. He said, oh, that's weird, isn't it? Oh, and then he made this speech about the, the, the Spice Girls saying that uh, Spice Girls videos, he said, were like porn movies, but with worse mood music. <sighs> So you were left with this terrible image of this mad bloke with his seedy wig, you know, watching what we used to call blue movies, his Alhambra Castle. Yeah. Very, very strange. Film. And as, well as people like Pete Townsend who kind of dealt with him, knew that there was a fair chance that when they dealt with him, he was actually carrying a gun. Absolutely. Which he did from, you know, early on. Yeah, know, yeah. Is, yeah. Uh, because Andrew Oldham's theory, uh, I think, is the, is the what... He was already pretty unstable. What tipped him over the edge was the Tom Wolfe feature in was it Esquire? Oh right, saying, he's saying he's a genius. He was the he was the first person in popular music with you know the, the word genius was placed. When did that come out? 
I'd have 65 probably or something like that. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, what the tycoon of teen, is that what it was the headline? I think it was. Um, little symphonies for the kids, all that Wasn't stuff. Was Brian go. Wilson being... being I, don't, uh, I think it was slightly uh, later. Maybe slightly later, slightly later. That, was Derek, that was Derek Taylor, actually, who uh, invented yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, Brian yeah, Wilson's I, a genius. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I thought... I didn't oh, do it, him any favours, either. It, absolutely. It's a, yeah, it's a really bad That's idea. It's, it's a bad idea. Pattern, isn't it? Yeah, um, yeah, they both became uh, unsettled. Yeah, um, with, you know, obviously, particularly terrible consequences yeah yeah in his case um so there we are this is a junction in the word podcast it separates that bit from this next bit so uh any other business are we joined by alex scold we are alex how's things you're in the snow aren't you um indeed well not literally in the snow um metaphorically uh, it, it's all it, it, it's all over me uh, and outside physically as well yeah. It You're in a winter winter wonderland up there in the Midlands. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It hasn't happened where we are yet, but uh, it's always the weather forecast says that it's coming in in about half an hour to London. We shall see. It's yeah. all around us, clearly. We hope so. I'm getting bombarded with uh, with WhatsApp movies of, uh, of clips of snow all around London from May to March. So there we are. We'll, we'll... I can never tell when people send you a, a clip of of the snow. I can never tell whether they're complaining or celebrating. You know, is it if they have small children they're celebrating? Yeah, otherwise they're complaining. <laughs> yeah, I suppose if it's Monday morning, got to dig a car out or something. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. It's a it's a serious business. So the air has been thick this week uh, with musicians complaining. Alex, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm looking at you, Alex Gold. No, <laughs> with uh, with varying degrees of justification. The uh, I it think I varying. <laughs> No, I, I was very taken to this little clip of, uh, of mid-year talking about the difficulties of, of touring in Europe post-Brexit. And, and Midge is, is able to speak from experience because he does remember the time just about before... Uh, he must have been... Re- Midge was born in 1953, so he must have been 18 or 19. Well, he what started was... early, didn't he? So you know with what I mean? Slick and all that, would they have yeah, toured well, Europe? Maybe they did. Yeah, yeah. There, would have been, there would have been something, you know. Yeah. And what he, and what he says is... Um, very nice, very good little clip, actually. He says, you know, there used to be things called carnets that, that, uh, that you had to produce pieces of paper when, you were, when any band were crossing a frontier anywhere in Europe. Naming exactly every piece of equipment they carried with them, which in those and, days wouldn't be much, really, compared to well, that. no, no, this went down to the last guitar string. Really, so I, I spent a bit of time playing with various fans from the seventies punk rock world who all remembered a time before Brexit, you know, before the European Union, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Um, and um, <clears throat> yeah, um, every, everything, literally everything, had to be accounted for. It was a huge pain in the ass. And didn't they have a right to say, OK, you've mentioned this uh, AC30 amplifier or something. Like, I want to see it. Get it out. I want to yeah, see it. Yeah, they there. had that right. Uh, yeah, if you broke a drumstick, you had to bring the dr- broken drumsticks back with you. Oh, really? Uh, 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 this, this, this is why um, yeah. uh, there's so much furore about it. Because to go back to that system after everything being so fluid and so easy and so simple, it's just... A complete logistical nightmare, and it's going to make it impossible for for bands under a certain level, and that level is going to be pretty high uh, to tour. I mean, even at the basic level, you know, even when I was touring personally, touring Europe with the grottiest punk bands, you know, uh, in Europe you're always guaranteed to get a sandwich and a bed, you know, um, so, and 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 paid. <laughs> um, the problem with the UK, I think, is because of our, because of because it's got such a rich musical history in, in in pop, the the supply is so far outweighing the demand, uh, and so you've just got this eminent overcrowding. And in Europe, there, there's always been a bit more space because of the geographical area is bigger, obviously, and you know um, there are various logistical factors which make it a lot easier for UK bands to to get a bit of a break in Europe. Um, and for a lot of those artists, that's simply not going to be possible as things stand. And I think that's where the where the where the um, um, where the problem lies. Yeah, 
no, I, I think they've got, a, they've got a very, you know, it's a really good point, it's a really fair point. It's not something that they haven't been saying for two or three years now, you know, but mm. uh, I know, I suppose at the moment it's not real because nobody's touring No, there's, there's anyway. time to sort it out. I mean, I'm hoping that, this, you know, this will be a fluid thing and things will be, you know, realigned as time goes on. But, I mean, even Roger Daltrey's gone back on the... <laughs> On, on oh, do you, do you mean Roger Dodson? That is a good thought. Good grief. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, Dodson, for example, he's obviously staunchly pro-Brexit and he was insistent that everything would be fine because you toured in Europe in the 60s, so why yeah. not? <laughs> um, but obviously this has not turned out to be the case. So, no, no. You know, and, like and of course, I was, I was thinking about this in, in the light of the, um, the fact that Glastonbury is, is off for, uh, you know this year as well Another year. yeah definitely and so uh which is obviously that affects huge numbers of people anyway on its own but it, it struck me that um kind of name groups traditionally in the summer they just do festivals across europe don't they that's yeah. what they do they do they play at glassbury and then they play somewhere in belgium and then they play somewhere in germany and and Italy and so forth. And it's based on the idea that it's relatively easy. It's quite smooth. They can work out how to get between those centres. And also and you don't have to do a huge number of gigs to generate quite a large profit because no, they're no, getting sure. paid vast amounts. Yeah, yeah. And but uh, you saw, Dave, you noticed that piece about Spotify, didn't you? About well, yes. Back, which is <laughs> because, just related, isn't it? Because really it, is, it is related to this, uh, to this business of supply and demand, which is that... Um, you know, there, there were also uh, the heads of the UK record companies were uh, in Parliament this week, you know, giving evidence in front of a select committee um, about, uh, you know, where they were given a very hard time about streaming payments because it's, it's now one of those things that's got through to the MPs that, oh, you know, musicians are being, you know, very badly treated in this. And so, and so nowadays, your average MP desperately wants to be on the side of the musicians even though your average mp probably hasn't thought very much about about the logistics of this at all and uh, and so clearly there are a lot of unsatisfied musicians understand that but i was i have interesting background to this is there's a really good column uh in music business worldwide just appeared this week by by tim ingham who's who's taking this whole question of streaming payments right on the nose. And he said, okay, let's look at all the money that comes in to Spotify from streaming. And I think it's worked it out to be it's six billion pounds a year comes in. He says, okay, now lots of these problems when people complain come about because of their, uh, their relationships with their record companies. Let's, let's discount that because let's say that Spotify don't keep any of the six billion. Let's say that the record companies didn't keep any of the six billion. Nobody else kept any of the six billion. You just took the six billion Gave it to the and musicians. you divided it amongst all the musicians. Okay. And I think you were, I think there's three million creators and artists. Okay. So six billion, three million creators and artists. So just divvy it up, you know, the, the Marxist style between all of them okay how much do they get each and i think it works out it's just under two thousand dollars a year that's okay? right so that's not paying anybody's rent that's that's just not he said so clearly that don't it won't work so you know let's let's take i think it's forty eight thousand of those creators who account for most of the value and most of the use and let's give them more, okay? And so he works out that they get, I don't know, they get like $100,000 a year or something like that, which is kind of more like it. What does that leave everybody else with? You know, $50 a year or whatever. Because basically he's making the point, and here's goes back to what Alice's point about supply and demand. This has always been a business where there's far more supply than there could ever be demand. And, and, and there's, you know, my, my argument, I, I, I entirely sympathize with musicians that want to be paid more for streaming. My question is always the same. How much more? Well, I've got a theory about streaming. Um, Go on. 
probably going to be unpopular with, with musician kind, but trying to think about it as, as laterally as possible. So when you bought an album, I mean, how much realistically did, did the average band member get per album sale? I, well, if they didn't write the songs, not an awful lot. I mean, it depends why, what era of albums you're talking about. Well, a 10 quid CD, if I'm the bass player in a group and I didn't write the songs, how much am I getting? I don't know, 25p? Probably not even okay, that. 25p per album. How many times did the purchaser of the album play said album? <laughs> oh, well. Oh, I, I, I know what you're saying. So, you know, but that's the difference. That's the difference between buying and streaming. But streaming that, is radio. I, yeah, but I, I still think that, you know, there's kind of a disconnect in musicians' logic sometimes. With, with, oh, with how I these don't doubt are it. Doomed. And, and also they're assuming that streaming is taking away something from them. But actually, no, because... I mean, would, would you have really sold 100,000 albums anyway? Probably not. You oh, know, that, I've that's... got to say that there's a tendency among musicians, and I'm allowed to say this, I think, um, yeah. in that a lot of them think the world owes them a living. And it really <laughs> doesn't. Oh, I'm glad, I'm glad you said that. That's a, very, that's a very noble point of view to make on my, <laughs> as a musician. That's like a parental thing to say, doesn't it? You know. Okay, but you guys know. just feel, I mean, the situation is that you incredibly few can make a living out of streaming unless they're really well but, established. But well, except a, re, a few make a fortune. Few make a fortune, exactly. I mean, it's the same in all industries, isn't it? But, you know, very but, few make a living. And, and if you can't that, tour, if you can't tour at the yeah, moment, uh, and yeah. even when you can, you're not sure what the situation's going to be and how many people you can play to. And that, you know, going to Europe is going to be impossible. And then also live, my, my, my problem is I think that live performance, the novelty of that, virtual live performance, has really, really, really faded. Mm. You know, I, do, do you feel any proximity and any warmth from seeing somebody performing on a Zoom from their kitchen? I'm not sure if I do anymore. Right. You know what I mean? You need an audience. And a slight tangent, I watched the Eddie Izzard live show from the Hammersmith uh, Studios. Oh, it's snowing. It's absolutely tipping <laughs> it down. How exciting. <laughs> Have you got snow day? It's absolutely <laughs> charging down. Big old flakes. How exciting. <laughs> no, but I watched the uh, Eddie Izzard thing the other night. Really, really disappointing. You know, there's, there's a guy on his own in a studio with just a camera operative, and he needs an audience reaction. I mean, admittedly, you probably a comedian needs that more than, Definitely. Than, than a musician who's simply playing things and would like some kind of response at the end of each song. But by the same token, you know, you cannot in any way kind of uh, replicate the experience of seeing somebody live if you do it online. It's just com possible. comedy is slightly different in that, am I correct in suggesting that with comedy, you kind of rely on the audience reaction around you to justify your own uh, uh, finding of the joke humorous? Nobody wants to be the only one like, yeah. in the line. You know, so what yeah. are you? What, you know, when you go and when you go and see when you go and see a band, what are you? What are you? What are you paying for? Music, or are you paying for excitement? You're probably paying for excitement. Paying for excitement, you're, you're paying you know, room with a lot of kindred spirits. You feel the same way. That's the thrill. You, know, you go and see a, you go and see a comedian. What are you playing for? What are you paying for? Clever humor or laughter? You're paying for laughter. Yeah, you're absolutely. For what's produced? And if, the, and if there's nobody there, it's not produced. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, you know. but so, it's saying that, you know, the game's obviously changed and maybe it's up to the artist to, to, to find a way to make it work, you know. Uh, I mean, we're used to this particular status quo and that's fine, um, but it doesn't mean it's, it doesn't mean that here is right and here is wrong, you know. Maybe, it, it, maybe the, the, the way in which the art is delivered needs to change according to the times and, uh, and maybe there is a way to make it palatable. Well, it has all, you know, if you look at the, the history of, you know, well, you look, the music business, the model has changed I mean, regularly. For, for example, be... Liam Gallagher's stream on the, on the River Thames, what, uh, a couple of months ago, that went down really, really well because it was really well done. You know, it, it is possible to capture, um, yeah. capture a vibe, capture an energy, capture, yeah. you, know, you know, really give. But you're only doing that money. once, aren't you? You're only doing, uh, whereas the idea of a touring is you can take the experience that you sold in Glasgow on Monday and you can sell it in Birmingham on Wednesday. But that, that model was built out of pure necessity because the model of touring was built at a time when the digital world simply didn't exist. And, you know, and that's still being perpetuated. So really, I mean, as relevant as touring is, obviously it is relevant. It is still a model that 
that was that was built at a time when it was a necessity rather than a luxury. Although, but just before this whole thing started, mm. um, you know, we've marked upon uh, about, uh, remarked about this in in previous podcasts. I think Britney Spears was in the middle of a kind of fifty night Vegas yeah. stand, wasn't she? So were Aerosmith, because if what the all these people had discovered was. We don't want to tour anymore. We are going to be in a place and people are going to come to us. So that's a paradigm a, shift. And maybe the other yeah. But well. maybe the other paradigm shift is not bringing the same experience to people in different places every every or in the same place but with a different audience. You know, you're playing to the internet and the internet's very big. There's a lot of internet. So maybe maybe the <laughs> maybe the, maybe, the, maybe, the, maybe the trick is maybe the new the new paradigm shift is um mixing up the experience you give so instead of you know just plowing out the same thing every night you've got to, you've got to make things slightly unique every time you do them maybe that's yeah. it and maybe that's a good thing for the art as well you know for the creators it's 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 a blocker to laziness it keeps you thinking on your toes you know if it's done right then surely everybody wins mm. but uh, will will it be able to you know will this kind of shift be able to keep as, as many as much supply as we currently have because like you said go back to your punk groups that you were talking about touring you were saying basically there's no audience for this in Smethwick, but if i take it to you know belgium there might be yeah well uh, you know, I, I, they, I suppose... so you have to go out and find the audience well, that's it. And, and and historically, you know, the music industry has been one of extremes in the sense that you've either made, you know, in people's minds, you've either made it or you haven't. You know, there's no, it's it, there's been a very black and white perception of how yeah. musician careers play out. But that's absolutely not true. I mean, in the past sort of 10 years or so, I suppose, um, you've had all these cottage industries springing up. So, yeah. you know, so where the dream, the dream has gradually shifted away from, you know, one day I'll get signed to to be, um, you know, w one day I'll be able to make at least part of the living out of this, right. you know, um, yeah. and it's become about what you can do rather than what other organisations can do for you. And, uh, you know, maybe a development of that is, you know, I just need to be able to do it. You know, how do you validate success? I, I think that's what it comes down to, isn't it? How do you personally validate your success and that well, things it's, are going it's well. Being a musician, surely you validate success by saying I make a living out of it. I'm a professional musician. I just I managed to keep going, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting. We're talking to talking to Graham Goldman about this, weren't we, the other, the yeah. other day in Word in Your Attic. And Graham said there's not a day goes by that I don't thank the Lord that I'm able to continue doing this. Which oh. is, you know, very long sighted and, and great and gracious of him. But you look at somebody like Graham, that the fact he's able to keep doing that is is related to the fact that he wrote a couple of hits in the 60s, more than a couple, mm -hmm. and wrote some hits in the 70s. And so that enables him to keep going. Yeah. And he wrote them at a time when you could make serious amounts of money out of that as well. No, but I'm not saying he's not <clears> living <throat> on the cash, but but the point being part of what he's trading on still is the success that happened then. Oh yeah. And and if you have success in the music business at any point, it keeps on resounding yeah. in some way many, yeah. many years later, doesn't so this, it? This is why it's That's important the thing that to... nobody, nobody thought about at all. But again, I think a lot of musicians have a very black and white view of, of what success is. And, you know, they think success is, you know, um, playing, you know, playing my own songs, my own wares, and just, just doing that one thing. Um, yeah. And yeah. I can't speak for everybody, but what I realised pretty quickly was I needed to, to decide what it was I wanted to do what, uh, in order to be able to sustain something that was going to make me feel fulfilled. And I realised that the core, at the very core of everything was, I just wanted to play. So um, I went from being a student who wanted his indie band to be signed by a record label, and that was it, to um, just, just try my luck everywhere and, you know, dipping into orchestras and musicals and all this kind of stuff that, when I was 19, I wouldn't have no. batted an eyelid at because because I realised that, that, that you know what I personally wanted was not to um, not necessarily to to ha have success with with my own particular stuff. I just wanted to play. Just wanted to play. 
which I, I think most most musicians still do. I'll tell you what the funniest <laughs> funny thing about this: <laughs> musicians, you know, uh, talk, uh, and members of parliament talking about uh, you know, people in bands can't make a living anymore. And yeah, all right, fair enough. Um, but it, I, I couldn't help thinking. I don't remember back in the 70s or the 80s, back in the days of physical product and tour support and advances. I don't remember ever, ever meeting a band saying, do you know, I'm quite happy. I'm quite satisfied. I've, well, I've got, we've got a decent income coming in. You know, well, the royalty good. checks, they're right. I don't, nobody said that at all. I don't think it happened. No, I don't but, think but, 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 no, but any, any musician is going to be agonised by the fact that they should be doing better. No matter who they are, they still feel that they haven't quite achieved what they ought to have achieved, whether it's in terms of commercial success or, 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 or critical yeah. approval, you know. Yeah. But another aspect I think is interesting is that, wow, it really is snowing hard here, um, is that, um, you know, that there was a kind of business model whereby you were signed and you had two or three years to develop, you know, with a little bit of security. And that's gone. And I think that's really hard because you can't expect, I mean, what you were signing was potential. You were signing possibilities. Somebody might have some commercial success immediately. But the idea is by their third album, they will have got their sound. They will have sorted out the lineup. They will have got rid of so-and-so. They would have brought somebody else in. They would have got a commercial sound and they'd be on it. And they'd be making a living for them and for us, you know. And that's kind of gone now. Well, yeah. it's gone because... It, it, what bands used to live off was advances, and yeah. advances were, were gambles. Yeah. That's what advances are. Somebody's saying, okay, we're going to mm -hmm. give you 150 grand, out of which you're going to have to make the album and live for a year or yeah. whatever. But and uh, I, I, because we, we think it might work, because the model of the business was one act pays for the other hundred. You know, and so the other, the other, the other hundred don't. And out of those other hundred, maybe four or five might become the big earners again. Well, but equally, a lot yeah. of those advances were given to people aged you know, 18, 19, 20 years old. Um, and, you, you know, I, I think maybe that's one of the reasons there's so many car crash stories in, in, in the music industry, because, you know, you give, you give a lump sum that big to someone so young and, Chances are they're not going to go out by any it. type Jaguar. This is it. <laughs> yeah. This yeah. is it. the thing I found. I did some research for a book, and and the thing that I found that unites musicians across the ages is that as soon as they get get any get kind of they pay, have to advertise pay, the they fact they go and buy a car. Yeah, they, they just do. they just go and buy a mad flash car. Who was I reading about the other day? He bought three Bentleys or something like this. He could barely drive any of them and was never at home, you know. But it's just, that's what you had to do. Anyway, we've set the world of musicians to rights. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and nobody out be responding robustly to, to Alex's point that they think the world owes the living. I'm going into hiding. <laughs> <laughs> Get your tin <laughs> helmet on. <laughs> oh, Back in the bunker. What else have we got going on? In just, the world talk, just talking about re re reputations that last forever. I was, I was watching a Rick Stein programme the other day about uh, Cornwall. And, uh, and he said, I've got to interview a mate of mine who owns a, a pub around here. And he was a former member of Tucky Buzzard. <laughs> that was absolutely fantastic. I can't remember his name now. But there was this guy, Tucky Buzzard Dave, who had an album out called warm slash warm slash that's right yeah. and there he was this fabulous guy you know he still has he's still you know still training slightly on the idea he was a member of tucky buzz the so idea that, that you, you, brilliant yeah you, you can live on even being i know even being a member of the least successful group in pop history Wonderful. is is a, is a little bit of a calling yeah. card isn't it even all it those was. years late it's extraordinary so what else have we got going on in the world of Word in Your Ear, Word in Your Attic? Uh, we, 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 our most recent Word in Your Attic was with the great Simon Day, uh, which just went which out. Which is out, I think. It's really, yep. really which good. Is out. As was the one with Samira uh, Ahmed. Was Samira fantastic. Ahmed, yes. And uh, what have we got coming up? Have we got uh, further coming up? We're doing Paul Conroy next week. Well, we, we have a patron-only event. <laughs> oh, we do. Oh, oh, yeah, we got that, yeah. Mm. Yes, and on that's, Wednesday night. That's on Wednesday night. Six p.m. It's going to be re it's going to be fantastic. And we're Smash hits. We've dug out an old copy of Smash hits. We're going to revisit a copy of Smash hits. June nineteen eighty-one. Eighty-two, I think, isn't it? Mark? No, eighty-one. We're going to leave through oh, okay. it page by page. Okay. All right, fine. We're going to go through it page by page, 
and you know, so we'd love news to stories, have, adverts, <laughs> adverts particularly. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're going to be looking at where you could buy a bum flap. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, PVC Adam jacket. Where you could get a Walt Jabsco badge. That's it. Uh, all the stuff that everybody wanted. And what people wrote to the letters column. And whether you could do the star teaser. All that kind of thing. So if you remember those days fondly, please join us. Join us. For, join that, us and chip in. for that whisk through. And bring an item. Chicken. We're asking people to bring, bring a, a, an item from the, from the 1980s. to reminds them of that time. Absolutely. Yeah, any item from, from, from that period uh, that takes you back and uh, we'll have a bit of an antiques road show, show and tell there. <laughs> on we'll, be sending, the... we'll be sending a Zoom invite out to patrons only on that morning, so make sure you're, you're signed right, up okay. if you're not already. And yes, make sure you're signing up by going to uh, uh, patreon.com slash word in your ear and... Uh, and find out how you could how you could get nearer the fire. This podcast was brought to you by the word. Hey.